welcome to the Filmed Live Musicals podcast, a podcast about stage musicals that have been legally filmed and publicly distributed. The Filmed Live Musicals website contains information on nearly 200 musicals that have been captured live. Check it out at filmedlivemusicals.com. And now, on with the show. Welcome to episode 35 of the Filmed Live Musicals podcast. I'm your host, Louisa Lyons, and my guest today is Traylon Dollar, the Vice President of Partnerships and Brand Engagement at Broadway Licensing. Traylon has also worked as VP of Partnerships and Programming for Broadway On Demand, as Content Manager at Music Theatre International, and Artistic Director of the Little Theatre on the Square in Sullivan, Illinois. He currently serves on the advisory board for the New York Theatre Barn and produces the Night of a Thousand Genders Gala, benefiting the Gender and Family Project. Welcome, Traylon. Thank you, Louise. I'm thrilled to be here. Very excited to have you on the show. To start us off with, what made you fall in love with theater? Oh, such a good question. It was actually, how perfect, what a perfect question. It was movie musicals. It was when I was a kid, my mom would get ironing movies. And they were generally like, so it was time for her to do the ironing. And so she would often pick like an old classic movie. And at one point we kind of veered into musicals and I really loved it. And I think the first one I saw was Singing in the Rain. And I was like, this is, this is it. I loved that. And so I said, can we do more of those? And it was in that magical era that gave us Footloose and Flashdance. And it was truthfully... The Sarah Jessica Parker vehicle, Girls Just Want to Have Fun, also starring Helen Hunt, uh, that made me, at that point, I turned to my mom and I said, I want to do that. I want to be a dancer. And uh, I was eight years old. And so she said, well, there are classes you can take. I said, great. I want to do that. And she said, you'll probably be the only boy. And I said, great. Sure. I don't care. And uh, that's when I started dancing. But it was always kind of with this idea that at some point that would I, it was always connected to a story, right? I always wanted to be a dancer in a in a story, like a movie musical. In you want your dream is to be Gene Kelly. To be Gene Kelly, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> As everyone should aspire to be. Exactly, or you know, Sarah Jessica Parker. It was I. Those are the two that we really aspire to. <laughs> does not want to be Sarah Jessica Parker with the outfits she has worn, the role she has played, <laughs> Agreed. the men she has been with on stage, on film. <laughs> when did you become aware of filmed theater as opposed to movie musicals? Ooh, um, I think, you know, for so many of us, it was the Into the Woods and the um, Sunday in the Park the both of those recordings, right, were so, there was a time where we really all discovered that it felt like at the same time. And I had, I was an avid listener to the Into the Woods cast album when I was younger, like lit on repeat. Although interestingly, only ever act one uh, was all I ever really (laughs) wanted. I was like good after, happily ever after. I was like, I think I'm good. So Um, you version very well before it was a junior version. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) It was those, I think, were the first time that I saw an actual, like, show. But, you know, interestingly enough, I know it's, it was also a time, I grew up in a time where we were recording things that were happening live and playing them back. So in that sense, there was also, like, the Madonna Truth or Dare concert, right? It was mm-hmm. on HBO. We had to record that and then play that again. So although it wasn't, like, actual, it, it is very much theater, right? It, it's still storytelling. And mm-hmm. I would watch that on loop on my VHS and try to learn the dance moves which is probably awesome for a parent to watch their 11-year-old child dancing to Truth or Dare, but, you know. (laughs) Yes. And where did you grow up? Uh, I grew up in Spokane, Washington. So did you have access to live theater, like in-person theater? I did, yes. Uh, There was, it still is, a very thriving community theater, the Spokane Civic Theater that's been around forever. That's where I started performing. And then there was a really nice, like, uh, kind of Broadway touring venue. Um, So we saw a lot of those. The first show I saw actually was the Broadway tour of South Pacific, starring Mitzi Gaynor. Hmm. So it was, uh, yeah, that was the first kind of pass-through. And when you were studying dance, what kind of dance did you study? Uh, I started with tap dance and ballet, just like every good kid did back then. <laughs> this was long before any kind of modern or hip hop was an option, but yeah. 
And what no, happened, I'm making myself sound really old. Not <laughs> at all. VHS. <laughs> I am of the VHS generation yeah. also. Into the woods of VHS for the win. <laughs> yes. We didn't have PBS in Australia, so it was all about the VHS. There, yeah. <laughs> I'm curious what led you from dancing to the career that you have now. Can you give us kind of a, a summary of, of that trajectory? Absolutely. The first show I was ever in was the tour of Peter Pan starring Kathy Rigby. It was coming through the town. They needed a couple of extra kind of filler lost boys. And they went to our dance studio and that's where they were. They did the auditions. And I got cast in that. And the minute I was on that stage and finally combining dance with storytelling, which was what had you know kind of excited me so much from the beginning, I was in love. That was it. I knew I had to do it. And so I started auditioning for the community theater, doing shows there. And really, like, I was all in by the age of 11. I was performing pretty nonstop all the way through high school, went to school for uh, theater and, and music, and was really kind of on that performance trajectory. And then got felt like I, I um, there's that great moment that a lot of, like, directors and choreographers talk about when you start finding yourself kind of stepping out and looking at the whole picture and really as an actor you got to be in that moment and I had started having that and started hearing other people talk about that moment and I said I think I need to pull out a little bit Mm. Um, and so moved into choreography and directing was in that space for about 10 years as freelance and then moving into kind of artistic management as an artistic director and then there was just kind of a shift moment where I really thought how can I scope out even more in these projects? You know, where, where's the next kind of step back? And I got really interested in producing and kind of being it from the very early stages. But to get to that point, mm-hmm. I, I had no idea about the business of theater at all. Uh, and so I got a job in uh, at MTI, Music Theater National, in the licensing department. And really is to kind of start kind of that was my first way of into the business of, of theater and what that looked like. So that was kind of, I went from the art side to the business side and then kind of just kept adding different layers as we went and trying different journeys and tried the marketing for a bit and press. And, you know, just, I like to collect as much as I can so I can have a real holistic view of the whole picture. Oh, wow. Okay. I'm still, I'm stuck on Kathy Rigby. (laughs) (laughs) That her, uh, one of her shows in Peter Pad was filmed. I'm, I'm yes, not sure it was. Off my head where it was filmed, yeah. but also another gateway drug for many people. Absolutely, yes. And oh, she was so great. I was an unnamed lost boy, and there was a moment where we had to all kind of skip around Wendy, and she took the time to give me a name, which was so sweet. Wow. Yeah. And she's, she's like, she's still out there, isn't she? She's still teaching. Uh, she sure and, is. And yeah, doing absolutely. Her thing. Yeah. What a legend. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a cool story that start, you know, being inspired by what you saw on screen to pursue classes and, and doing that for so long and then moving out to that bigger picture to to work on the administrative side and the, the business side of show business. Yeah, it's been it's been great. And, uh, and uh, everything has as it happens in life, right? Everything informs the next moment in our life. And so now it's just so thrilling to be able to really uh, understand, identify with, you know, everybody from the creator, the the writer from that very first idea, through the actor, through the producers, through what this means, you know, in a larger scope for the business opportunities. It's, it's, It's great to be able to have that kind of perspective. Yeah, so and, very fortunate. And to understand the ins and outs of all of those different areas, because an actor's perspective is very different from a director's perspective, is very different from a producer's perspective, it's very different from an audience member's perspective. So to have all of that in your brain, I think serves you really well. Thank and, you. and speaks to the projects that you've been working on as well. Like it's it's very evident that you have all of that swarming around in your brain. <laughs> So that leads me to ask, what was the status of streamed theater prior to the pandemic, like right before March 2020? What what did it look like? Uh, uh, I mean, I certainly was not engaging in that space at all. Um, other than, you know, I think anything that was kind of larger scale that we knew people were recording, really in that more like 
I feel like that's more like uh, cinematic versions of shows. It is filmed theater, but as far as like kind of in the streaming, live streaming space, I'm sure people were experimenting, but it was nothing that I was in, 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 engaging with mm -hmm. as an art form, um, really until the pandemic. And what can you speak to what the rules were with either MTI, MTI or Broadway licensing for high school community groups, um, community groups to amateur theater groups to mm -hmm. film their productions pre-pandemic? Sure. There were, it was always so interesting. So a lot of those rights are separate from the performance rights that one of those licensing companies has. Um, so a lot of times those are wrapped up, especially with MTI shows, because so many of them are based on movies. So a lot of those rights lie with the film studios. Um, so they weren't available and people would always get mad. Wow, you mean I can't record my production? And I'd say it's not my, I, as a, when I was working at Lysa, I would say it's not my choice. I, see, I can't say yes. Um, but, um, the universal. <laughs> <laughs> totally. <laughs> um, and so there really was no kind of system actually to deal with that. Uh, and, and the conversation was always very specifically, right, about recording the show uh, for like an archival purpose. Now, there was always at MTI, uh, when I moved over to Broadway Licensing, there were certain shows that did have those rights. And that was really specifically about archiving a show to old school days, make those VHSs, and that you could sell to your cast for the cost of making them and you couldn't make a profit on it. That was kind of the general space there was no conversation about what it meant to live stream or or be in a, just a digital kind of only space. Mm. I think the language still says in most contracts, you can only replicate it for the cost of that like replication, which would imply at this point, right, making DVDs. But I can't imagine anybody's actually making, I mean, may, maybe, but I don't know where you're watching it. Yeah. So <laughs> what what is the cost of, you know, making a digital copy of something and so it's really interesting. Even the language hasn't been updated. Yeah. That's, it's, or had not been at the time. It's something like with equity contracts and uh, on a professional level, why streaming is so difficult because the language in those contracts is not in the 21st century yet. <laughs> it is not. Yeah. Well, and you know, uh, I think it just wasn't, it wasn't on people's minds. That, that's what, what is the thing that has been so exciting to be uh, so active in kind of this blossoming of stream theater, digital theater, um, really being kind of at the forefront of a lot of these conversations is that we didn't even know that we needed it, hmm. if that makes sense. And there, was, there are issues, challenges that have plagued the industry at every level from amateur to professional, Broadway, global stages that we've been constantly searching for solutions for and no, as far as I know, I was not a part, I've never heard wind of somebody being like, you know, I might work on this streaming. Mm -hmm. And so it's been something I kind of, uh, I am so grateful to have been a part of this is to all of a sudden be like, Oh, wait a minute. This tool presented itself out of literally like necessity to keep our doors open. And then it started like, we started having these aha moments along the way of like, Oh, Oh, that's why I think it wasn't built in that contract because we we believed um, theater existed in one form, which was in that building. You had to be in that building for it to matter. That's the only way it could. It wasn't even discounting anything else. There was just one option: yeah. <laughs> a building. That's it's so interesting to hear it through that lens, uh, having you know researched the history of, of filming live theater. We've been doing it since we invented cameras, but the distribution, like technology has changed it vastly. You know, initially we were filming on a soundstage like vaudeville acts for shorts in for uh, screening before sound films or, you know, they were short talkies. And then how cinema has changed that, like that they were broadcast to cinema and broadcast on television and but it's been very sporadic, you know, like pre pandemic, I was excited for one or two releases a year. It was like, woo, you know, Oh my goodness. There's a, there's a Broadway show streaming, uh, uh, streaming being broadcast in the cinemas, this excitement. And now yeah. I cannot keep up with the number of shows that are available because of digital technology and the internet, like with YouTube and Vimeo and all these platforms that are popping up, 
it's so much easier to stream work and make work available in a way that it never has been before. And like you say, with the pandemic, it has exploded it. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. And yes. So what happened on, on your end, March 2020, we have the lock, the shutdown. What happened at, at Broadway licensing? Sure. Great question. <laughs> I will say we had, there was this conversation that would pop up every once in a while around stream. I don't even think we were using the word stream, but there was this conversation of uh, there is all, there are always family members who are not going to be able to attend because of geography, tend the production that a student is in. That will always be the case. How is that being solved? Generally like, you know, dad's in the back with his iPhone illegally recording and then sending kind of like, you know, a not very well produced, obviously clips of the show to grandma. Um, But we kept thinking like, there must be a better solution. And what is that? That's about as far as the conversation had gone, but we knew there was an opportunity there. So when the shutdown happened, obviously, you know, the licensing business stopped. I mean, nobody's licensing shows. They were mostly canceling, trying to figure out what to do. The question started being, and then, you know, it really came from, God, I remember the first people, God bless them, the teachers, were the first people to say, can I do a show on Zoom? And I think at that point, I had maybe been on two Zoom calls. And I was like, I don't even know what they're talking about. Sure. I mean, let's figure out how to do that. They, they, it was the teachers who were like, we got to find a solution. Let's do this. And so we at Broadway Licensing kind of split into two groups. There was group one that was reaching out to all those authors because we didn't have those rights to give. They had never been put into a contract before. So we needed to see what those conversations were. And then the other piece was, uh, as a company that protects intellectual property for these authors, how are we going to ensure that their work is safe, right? And we knew that, like, YouTube is not a safe place for their work to be because, you know, people can rip it. So we needed to make sure it was being protected. And (laughs) so in true fashion, it is a very, uh, we are a very, tech forward adventurous company so we're like well we should probably just make something is what we should do (laughs) so that was the beginning of our pandemic i think i had like a week of like what's happening and then week two we're like let's make something wow i kept the groundwork of people just just the part of reaching out to authors like there's hundreds of titles in your catalog that's a lot of people to make phone calls to and emails to it's that's a lot of man hours Yes, it was it was a, a heavy lift, but I, I you know, I think something I will never forget is the true generosity of the opening of season one of the pandemic. It was <laughs> full of generosity. It was just people doing anything they could to take care of each other, to make opportunity for each other. Um, so that was that moment. It really was. We would call one agent, and they would call all you know 50 of their clients and say how do you feel about this so it was really a group effort that's really extraordinary and i i'm picturing the movie about you know when we make the movie about 2020 that this is like its whole own movie how that (laughs) yes there are you know documentaries about broadway and the west end but this back-end stuff about how we make theater accessible to high school groups and community groups and um it's so it's just as important and you know, it's the backbone of, of why the bigger industry exists. Agree. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, Broadway licensing launched Showshare out of uh, this? Yes, Showshare was a piece of uh, the, the actual division was Broadway On Demand. Oh, right. um, of which was kind of two pieces um, again, we stumbled our way there. The original intention was, yes, Showshare, which was a platform for uh, groups to stream their shows on that would protect the shows that we represent. Mm-hmm. Um, as we were getting that up and running, we were like, we also had a moment where we noticed that a lot of people were making content. And I don't know if you had this experience. I've talked with so many theater nerds like myself that had the experience of like the early days pandemic theater nerd streaming schedule you'd be like okay i have like uh i have a facebook live event at seven eight i gotta bop over to youtube then i gotta bop over here on playbill to watch this and i we started saying like 
we, this is nuts. Like, if we're all going to be sitting doing this for a while, there should be one place for all of this content to exist. And uh, so that we had, like, again, branched off and had a piece that was really focused on creating a central home for digital content being created in the moment, um, as well as then the platform for once people were ready, because, you know, there was a quite a gap there of shutdown to when organizations were able to start streaming their shows. So folks can go back and listen to our episode with Sean Sarconi, the CEO of Broadway on Demand, to learn more about the creation of Broadway on Demand. And I, as you were talking earlier, you reminded me of the story he told about uh, his mother-in-law not being able to watch his kids in their production. And that was like the seed for him yep. um, <laughs> of wanting to create a platform for people to stream their productions. So let's, I want to dive into show share a bit more. Can you sure. explain what it is for folks who aren't aware of it yet? Sure. It's a delivery distribution service uh, for anybody streaming a show. Uh, and it's, you know, we use that term streaming. That means anything from I've recorded my show and I want it to be available, you know, on demand for a specific period of time, or I'm actually live streaming. Um, or I want it to be I pre-recorded and it's going to be on at 7 p.m., you know, on Tuesday, whatever that looks like, kind of any of those options. Um, and we specifically wanted to make sure that we had an OTT platform so that there was apps involved. So there's a, um, a Apple TV app and a Roku and Fire Stick at all um, kind of for those folks to, to put the shows up on. When people sign up to show share to stream their show, what support is provided or what what happens when they sign up for show share? Great. That was wow, such a good question. Because uh learning customer service by trial by fire, right? <laughs> Nobody knew what they were doing. So the level of, you know, here you think, oh. Here's a platform. Toss your show up here. Everything will be great. But what we were finding, and again, especially because we are so committed in the educational space and with teachers, that it was truly teachers saying, I have no idea what I'm doing. I need help from beginning to end. And so we need to quickly staff up. We left, we left our offices in February of 2020 with 14 people. And I think by the time we launched ShowShare, we had added 30 new employees. Um, because we realized there was such a need to make sure that every single person had the time to like talk through, here's what I'm trying to do. How do I do this? It wasn't just like we were teaching, here's how you do it on Zoom. Here's how to get the video to us. Here's how to create graphics to go here. You know, so in the early days, it was so much of that. Um, and we've, we've held on to that, that there is, a, you know, as much white glove service as people need. And um, one of the things I love doing I, I was kind of existing more working with kind of the, um, some of the major regional theaters and uh, or even like uh, conferences. And what, what I love to be is like, uh, we, this is all new. What can it be? What can we do? Let's start there. And so my question, always first question is, what are your goals? Is this, are we looking to make a bunch of money? Are we looking to introduce a whole new show to people? What is that? And then let's start ideating about what that looks like in a digital space. So, um, so I think, you know, it's, it's been all of that along the way. I think people now are pretty savvy. They're like, I know how to stream my show. <laughs> Shoot me that. <laughs> our, our TMP code, I'm, I'm in. So, um, but I still love those conversations about let's really like think big and think what, what's possible in this space and all the ways we can interact at once. Right. We can, we can have, sure. We can record a production, at its dress rehearsal, and we can stream that production on demand for two weeks. We can also have a special opening night performance, you know, that is at 7 p.m. It's for a higher ticket price. And after that special 7 p.m., then we're also going to have a talk back with the authors. Or we're also going to have this, you know, that we can start looking at add-ons to really create experiences where we're... Um, we're engaging with digital content. Uh, it's, it is a true thing we learned, right? We are already seeing pushback. Digital theater is not real theater. Real theater has to be in the building. A part of what we're missing is the engagement, being in the moment, 
there are so, I have seen so many people come up with really beautiful solutions to how to create community in that space, um, how to create that same level of excitement. Uh, one of my favorite stories is early days, um, I was partnering with ACT in San Francisco and um, Perseverance in Alaska. They were doing a co-production and it was fully live, basically four actors on Zoom, um, but the whole show had been blocked and they were doing it live for, I think, like a week, four performances live. <clears throat> and they came up with the brilliant idea of opening the digital venue um, a half hour early. And so half hour before the show, if you logged on, there was a DJ playing music. There was trivia. There was a chat where there were people were like asking questions, engaging. There was information about the author. It was everything you get when you're sitting in the theater with your program, right? And more. I mean, they also like honored their sponsorships, which was genius. It was such an engaging moment. And then it also created this the buzz that you feel and then the curtain was gonna go up and we were all in this digital space together and we were typing oh my god it's happening this is really we're gonna see this you know it, and so i've seen it succeed in that way in the way that is often so discounted that this this is not the same experience so um anyway i Oh, yes. No. You, you hit on one of my buttons. <laughs> you're, you're speaking my language. And two points to that, that first of all, uh, how there have been studies done that show that people watching on screen can have just as much an emotional reaction to watching live theater specifically on screen as someone sitting in a in-person audience. And how digital platforms can connect those people who are in disparate places. Mm. My example would be uh, last year, if a theater in the Philippines streamed a musical called Rack of Ages, and it's a, a Filipino jukebox musical. And my family, my mom's family comes from the Philippines, they were immigrated to Australia. And I was able to watch the show from New Jersey with my mom in Sydney from this thing in Manila, like it was so cool that, and we were like chatting on Facebook Messenger while we were watching. <laughs> and like, that was such a cool moment for me because I haven't been able to see a live show with my mom in a very, like over a decade. And to be able to have that experience was so cool. And people are making friendships and fan clubs are forming. Like there's, there's a whole community of people. It does just because it's not in person doesn't mean it's not real. Yeah, absolutely. Amen. <laughs> and then what you were saying about all this extra content that companies can create. For me, it's like the DVD extras. Like mm. you used to be able to get like director's commentary or go behind the scenes or watch like a featurette on, you know, how this thing was made. And I love when theater companies or shows do those like talkbacks afterwards and you can engage with the, the director or the writer or the actors. Um, and there's there's a whole world of content there that can be explored. Like, how did we build this set? How you know, there's there's so much that can be explored. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And there's so many ways also to um, change our perception and perhaps change our engagement level with a show. Uh, the the idea I've been waiting for. I keep I've re I've literally suggested this to so many people. Um, but let's do my big Broadway version. What if I could buy a ticket to Wicked, but from Elphaba's point of view. What if she was wearing a camera and I could be Elphaba? Yes. I would buy that ticket every night. Yes. Well, and then you can be Glinda and Fiero. Yes. yes. And then think about what that means to like actually like be there and see a show and then see the audience and they're cheering for you and you're at home and you get your broom and you're defying gravity right along with her and you feel like you're flying. I mean, like that is like an experience that like. Yes. Or to be at the stage manager's prompt desk to like the different perspectives that you can get. Yes. yes. Oh, absolutely. What does it mean? And what does that mean for like inspiring people to be stage managers. That's, a, a, I love that idea, right? What does that feel like? What does that look like? What's that experience? And how does that deepen our engagement to, to the art form, right? Which is really what I think there's opportunity to do. And obviously, as we know, a need to do that, to deepen 
uh, engagement and invite more folks in because we have a, a problem with with inviting enough people into those buildings. So, Broadway, if you're listening, you should hire Traylon to be your marketing director, but he's very busy with Broadway licensing right now, and changing the world. <laughs> I like my inner wicked band girl is dying right now. <laughs> Don't you want to, I mean, it's just, it would be the best. I would like probably get green hand paint just so I could like look down and see my hands also be green and like just, oh, it'd be amazing. Yes, we need that. And <laughs> the potential for live shows to engage with audiences and with fans in that way, you know, I, I love the idea of one day we'll be able to all put on a, our accessible virtual headset and pick any seat in a theater and watch the show. You know, the, the, right now we're limited by technology, but we're not that far away also from Correct. that being possibility. And uh, how, yeah. like you say, we can open the doors. Agree. I, I'll tell you, I, I've been sharing this story because I think it was so interesting. I spent two and a half years. First, it was like, I can't believe I work for a tech company. I have no idea what anybody's talking about. Uh, or I'm making a tech company. <laughs> I was like, just like winging it hardcore. Then I started like, okay, I get this. And then, like I said, the series of aha moments of like, whoa, wait a minute. What does this mean? People can watch the show with their families in different parts of the world. That's crazy. Um, one of the first shows we streamed, there was an uh, Australian actress, actually, and her family had not seen her perform in, like, seven years, and they were able to watch the stream production, and they were like, it was so amazing to get to watch her on stage. I mean, like, that plus a million things, right? Like, the fact that every performance could have closed captioning, where we know that a theater can't always afford to have every performance signed, right? Like, every performance is automatically sensory-friendly, because I can always adjust the volume. I can always adjust like how bright the screen is. Like all of those things were like, oh my God, yes, 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 yes. So then after two and a half years, I finally went back into the theater and I thought, oh, what, what is gonna happen? <laughs> Am I gonna be like, oh, I have just been snake oil salesman <laughs> for two and a half years or am I gonna really like, what is this experience gonna be? And the first show back that I saw was Dana H. Um, which, you know, for listeners that haven't seen it, it was a one-woman play uh, that specifically was very uniquely crafted. And it was very, like, to, it was the reason I bought the ticket was to see this actress having this performance that was very finely crafted. I, uh, because I have a limited price that I can pay for a ticket, my seat was in the back of the theater. And... Um, I also don't have terrific vision at my age. Um, so uh, I was so excited and there I was and that buzz and you're in the building again. And the show started and I realized that I could not make out her features. Like um, I, I couldn't see what was happening, all the nuance that, was the, that the actress was putting into the performance. And I, it was such an intimate piece. Uh, but because of two uh, barriers uh, for accessibility, um, you know, one just my kind of eyesight and then the other one being um, my financial ability to, yeah. ability to be able to see it, that I wasn't able, I, I, I didn't see the full richness of the show. Now what I did get to experience was that magical moment when an audience breathes together when we all gasp at the same time, when we all respond. And that is something that is hard to replicate. I understand that. And so it was like the perfect moment because it was such a, all of this can and should exist in at the same time, right? We should have all of this because all that I wanted to do the minute that show ended was I wanted to go home and watch it again and be able to see her face mm -hmm. and to see that nuanced performance. It, that is all that happened. I was like, I would watch it. It's it's pretty heavy material. So I, maybe not that night. I maybe <laughs> won't watch it directly after, but <laughs> probably the next night I would. I would have wanted to experience that in that whole, whole new mm -hmm. space. And it was just this beautiful affirmation of, I was like, oh, this is true and this is real that accessibility is an issue and i think i had kind of forgotten that i thought that you know 
at a $60 ticket in the back, I was never going to be able to see the show. And then all of a sudden for two and a half years, I could see the show. <laughs> you know, I got so used to it. So, um, so it, it was just a, a very affirming moment in the work that we've been doing and the work that needs to continue moving forward. And my hope one day is that video recordings of performances will be as accessible as cast recordings where you walk out and, you know, just like you said, you walk out into the lobby after the show. I love this. I want to experience it again. I may not be able to come back in person for whatever reason. I don't live in New York city. I don't have the funds to buy another ticket. Um, but to be able to purchase like a link or a DVD, I mean, of course, DVDs are also the way of VHS now, but, <laughs> you know, to be, a USB stick or so, I don't know, something like, you know, to be able to purchase video content. I think we're not there yet, but I think it's not far away either. I would say, you know, and I think, sure, that's, that is where the purists start getting right. They're like, that's not the same. So I'm in a positive. How about instead, every show has the option for me to watch it live. Let, I'll, let me buy a ticket. I'll come at what you tell me what time it's at. Let me come at that time. That would be terrific. Yeah. You know, and then maybe we think about how we rebroadcast that so people all over the world could see it or people with schedules that can't show up to a 7 p.m. show. People with childcare, people with work. Correct. Yes. All, all the myriad of reasons. Yes. yes. I bring it. So let's have I, it I'm ready for that where everything, you know, let, let's have the yes and and recording. Yes. But I know that's where some people really start. They say that's where they really draw the line that that recording and I do I know what it did for you I know what it did for me of being able to see those shows early on and how that inspires the next generation and how that can live on but um but also at the time we didn't have the technology to watch it live so yeah. sure I'm game let's do that and it doesn't mean that everything should be available all the time everywhere you know there are strategies for each show can why not <laughs> Okay. Okay. Wait a minute. Can I, do I have time for another no. soapbox moment? Please do. Soapbox oh, away. Yeah. <laughs> so another space I never thought I'd be spending time in is sports and professional sports and 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 you know uh, how we build um, uh, sports fans starting at a young age, right? And um, and so we know, right? Like in the high school space that that sports are so large, right? There is a, an amazing um, organization called the National Federation of High School Sports. They basically are streaming every sporting event from a high school. They are streaming between eight and 10,000 sporting events a day, a day, just of high school sporting events, right? Which is think itself about, theater, but go on. Sure. And now <laughs> let's think about like, all the other spaces where I can watch sports. So in professional sports, right? Is there at any moment at any day that you could not find professional sports to no. watch? It's always available everywhere. So what if we were streaming eight to 10,000 arts events? Let's say not even just shows. Let's say I'm, I'm streaming the choir. I'm streaming the band. I'm streaming the dance. I'm streaming the mind club. I'm streaming everything, right? That's all happening. And then there is literally... 10 channels that are constantly playing theater. Like how, how does that do anything but create more opportunities for people to interact with theater as an art form, right? I, there, the abundance is never a bad thing. And I think we have, it has been that there is this limitation of, there are this many venues that can show theater there are, it will run for this many performances. It is at this time. It costs this much. That limitation of the art form is why it is not, why there's not every person in the world doesn't say, I love theater, right? Because mm -hmm. we have limited the access for so long. So if there is truly an abundance and I could watch some form of, let's just say theater, forget the rest of the arts, just theater at any second of any moment of the day, I could turn it on for my nephew who's never seen a show. I could invite my neighbor to come watch a show. What's on? I don't know. Let's see what's on. Let's see who's doing a show. Oh my God, look at that. Wooly Mammoth is doing a show at seven. We could watch that. We could watch 
this show over here from Broadway. What are you into tonight? What do you feel like? What's your mood? I mean, it will only lift up the entire <laughs> art form. And we know to cap this off that theater creates a more empathetic world. Theater creates when you get to live in somebody else's body, you are, you understand them. You are more inclined and gosh, isn't that what we need? Empathy. Isn't that what we need is creativity. And if we had the ability to have an abundance of theater to help everybody get to that place, then listen, it won't cancel all everything, but I sure think it would go a long way. What the so, world needs now is more theater. An abundance. An abundance. Of theater. <laughs> Not just more. We need literally a theater happening everywhere at every second at all time that anybody can have access to. Uh, like the ESPN of, of theater. Absolutely. Yes. And there's a little platform called Broadway On Demand, which is getting us there. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're doing our best. <laughs> oh, that was that, I am so glad you had that soapbox. Thank you. That was fabulous. The top 20, the top musicals in 2020 that were streamed on Showshare were Emma, Disenchanted, and You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown. Mm -hmm. Did that change much in 2021? Were the similar titles? Those were the top musicals, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, you know, in our licensing world, Clue has been like our number one go-to hit for quite some time. Mm -hmm. And that um, uh, that was always the most streamed. But no, I think it's been about the same, you know. There are certain things that I feel like it's also tricky. Our, our data is tricky, right? There's limited options of what we can stream. And then there's things like what lends itself in our minds to what can be streamed. Because a lot of those early shows needed to be on Zoom only. We weren't even allowed in our spaces. So sure, Disenchanted, that's a lot of solo songs. That makes sense. I could put that in Zoom, right? I'm, it's le I'm less inclined to do a entirely Zoom production of Head Over Heels, although there were some that were amazing. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I think, you know... Um, there's been, I think it, those are always just the top shows anyway. Yeah. <laughs> what, uh, why do you think, apart from what you just said, that like, you know, it's easy to put six soloists on, on Zoom, but why do you think those shows are particularly popular among school groups? Um, you know, but, uh, Emma, that Emma that we license is all pop tunes. It's like contemporary music set to, the modern day telling of Jane Austen. I mean, like, that's a no brainer. <laughs> and, <laughs> and Disenchanted is Disney princesses, not Disney. Yes. <laughs> princesses related to certain <laughs> brands, uh, you know, that are recognizable. Very uh, princesses. <laughs> yes. Singing songs of female empowerment. Yeah, no brainer. I mean, yes. it's the same reason they're produced in person as well. What would you say to writers and composers who are writing now with licensing in mind? who are possibly streaming or who are, are hesitant to have their work available to stream? I would be surprised, first of all, if any writers, young writers, actually any writers are saying that this isn't a good idea. Um, you know, we've seen like Paula Vogel tweeting about that everything should be streamed, especially in related to Dana H. I, Paula probably had better seats than I did, but she also may have been like, I couldn't see. <laughs> um, uh, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of folks that are coming out that are really saying this is important for young writers. This is, this is, this is the other piece um, is when we talk about access, there has, there is a very powerful systemic gatekeeping system in theater, in the theater world. And that is in every aspect of it. That is from, it starts kind of what gets on Broadway and goes all the way down to what ends up on a high school stage, right? That small group of folks that is deciding what is considered a Broadway show and what gets there and what gets into what theater. That informs, right, generally, what's going to be on tour, obviously. So if I'm in a town that only has a touring venue, those same people are deciding that, right? And then it's also kind of dictating what's going to go into my regional theater, what's going to go into my community theater. Then it's going to decide what what shows are picked up by licensing houses, right? Because they want to know that there's an audience before they pick up that show. So then that feeds into what show is going to be at my high school that I'm going to be in. So this kind of small cobble of folks is really kind of deciding what we have access to. This has 
this idea is blowing that out of the water, right? This is, I, again, in this space now, well, as a creator, I don't need a venue. That's a big deal, right? I can make something that I can engage with in a truly meaningful way that audiences can engage with in a truly meaningful way without needing somebody to say, sure, I'll give you the space or sure, I'm going to give you that 100000 to millions of dollars, right? So artists are going to be able to present their work to the world to develop that fan base easier. And then I, as a theater lover fan, am going to have the opportunity to discover new work that if in my community nobody knows about that, nobody feels like that's going to make money or get butts in seats, then I'm never going to see. You know, so it's both ways. As far as the artist and audience relationship goes, this is key to discovering new voices as creators, new creative voices, which I think we all know there's a huge need for. Um, I think as to give multiple viewpoints, because again, right, we have that limited group and are they really thinking about all the viewpoints we want to share, all the opportunities? And also there's just not that many Broadway theaters. So even if they wanted to, they couldn't get everybody in there. So the, you know, this way now we can, everybody's story can be accessible. Wouldn't, uh, on our ESPN of Arts channel, wouldn't it be great if you could search by like, I want to see somebody's story who looks like mine. I am. Oh, you know what? There's this amazing production that you, you will be representative. Like, how exciting would that be? Or I'm very into this. I love like modern retellings of Greek stories that have pop songs. Like, great. Sure. That's there too. It's just... And I think obviously like the, I call it the Ratatouille moment, not just Ratatouille, right? That was a <laughs> moment that was artists going directly to audiences, right? And that's that's what we're seeing anyway, also in so many other spaces, um, in tech spaces, right? That's what we're doing is content creators having direct access to the audiences without gatekeepers. And that is what this provides. And I think it is beyond important. So. Absolutely. Wow. I, as you said that, what came to mind for me was Wordle, the the word game sweeping the internet. Yes. Where you know this guy just creates it at home for his girlfriend for, because he just wants to and he loves it, loves games, and you know now has a million dollar contract with the New York Times. And same with like Ratatouille or Bridgerton, like people just created content, put it out there on a streaming platform or on the internet, and you know people audiences find it. People find stuff and they yes. there's an audience for everything <laughs> yes yes there is yes yeah. yes oh fabulous what in terms of the, the the stuff that you're streaming i don't know if you can share these numbers but what what are the audience numbers like for um what people are streaming Sure. Great question. Um, you know, it, 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 again, it depends on the content. It also, I think I get a little squidgy about data of the last two years. I feel like it's, I call it, <laughs> I always say it's dirty data and we can't make decisions based on it because sure. You know what? A lot of people love watching bandstands which I love because, you know, the show was not on Broadway that long. I thought it was tremendous. And so I'm so happy that it's being exposed to a bunch of people. They see Broadway show, Bandstand. Awesome. I got to go see that, right? So uh, those kind of shows, Allegiance, Bandstand, anything like that, we've streamed the lab of Secret Garden was super popular for us, obviously, that right? Was that cast was amazing. Um, but... I get nervous about talking about that only because I don't think that is indicative of what the audience could be. Mm. We talk about this is amazing, right? There is access to everything. How, are we communicating that? Are we communicating that in the right spaces? Are we using our traditional marketing systems to get the same people? And are they the people like, are we getting in the spaces where we need to be getting to get people excited to see things that aren't what they think theater is, right? Like we took a lot of, I was in a very, as kind of um, loosely curating our catalog. Mostly I said, yes, thank you. Please put it on our platform. <laughs> By curation, you mean I said yes to almost everything. Uh, <laughs> because I was like, yes, yes, that's amazing. Um, but I uh, I don't think, I certainly know somebody in the marketing space. I didn't know how to find audiences for everything. It's 
as one company that's a startup, it was a hefty lift to like, where do I find these niche audiences? And do, do people know that there's a space where they can discover and how to discover? And also, I think there's a lot of stuff that people would say, I'm not a, really a theater person, right? Like, I'll see Wicked when it comes through my big theater in town, the touring venue, but I, I don't buy a season subscription to the cool artsy theater, although they might love it. So I, I think it's super important when anybody is talking about data of the last two years that we really keep it in a context, right? Of like, were we communicating to the right people? Do we know who those audiences are? I've already heard pushback from theaters saying, oh, I tried screaming and my, my subscribers didn't like it. Well, okay, sure. Your subscribers want to be back in your space. That's cool. But isn't the whole point to reach people who aren't your subscribers? So how do we do that? How do we get in those spaces? How do we invite people into our, like, to engage with the art we're making who may never come into your building? What does that look like? And I, that is a nut that we have not cracked. And I don't think we've been able to because we have not been back to the world where all the folks that want to be in the theater can be in the theater, right? We just still are, we're still not there yet. So it's going to take some time to crack that nut. And I think it's a really interesting conundrum facing streaming theater right now is that there is a plethora of content out there, but, mm -hmm. and there's a, a huge audience that wants it, but the two haven't met in the middle yet about where, where do we find this content? And those of us who know, we know we can go to Broadway on demand or, you know, there's, yeah. there are platforms out there, but I think the average person, like they'll hear about Clyde streaming on, uh, from second stage. Um, yeah. But, and then they, they sort of turn around and say, well, where else can I go for this kind of content? Mm -hmm. And they, they don't know where to look or don't know what to look up. And, you know, how do we target those people at a Google search, you know, streaming theater? What, it, what are they, what are the search terms they're putting in to find other content? And they, it's, it is a, you know, because we don't have the terms yet, I think also is another a whole other podcast. <laughs> um, it's it's difficult, like you say, like how do we market to people that might be interested in this content but don't necessarily know it's even there. Absolutely, and people who don't aren't even looking for theater content that might discover theater. That's that's the magic, right? Who's the person that doesn't know because that building has seemed so exclusive or uninviting, and so they've they've um, combined the idea of the building with the art form. And so what does it mean if they can have access to the art form without the building and might they be inclined to engage with that content in that way? Do we need to call it something else? Sure. Like, I, I am not sure. Again, like, I, I'm definitely not the smartest person in the room to crack these nuts. I am just acknowledging that the nuts exist. <laughs> <laughs> the nuts are here. <laughs> well, it has been so fantastic. I nominate you for president of theater marketing of the whole world, please. <laughs> I accept. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So before we finish up, I have a few questions that I ask all my guests. There Great. are no wrong answers and uh, you don't need to think about it too much. Whatever comes to mind is, is very good. So to start us off, what is your favorite musical? Sunday in the Park. It's one of my favorites too. Mm -hmm. Glorious. Yep. Do you have a favorite filmed live musical? Favorite filmed live musical. <laughs> Into the Woods for nostalgia's sake. Beautiful. Also, one Although that favorite. new West Side, I could, I, I'm like... I would probably, I will, when it's available, I will watch that nightly for a while. I think they just announced today it's uh, coming to Disney Plus. Super. Yes. Yep. That it, is right oh up God. there. So beautiful. Yep. So well done. Uh, so a filmed live musical is not quite a stage show. It's not a movie musical. What should we call it? Hmm. A filmed live musical is not a movie musical. Sure not a stage musical is that the other one well like it's it's not exactly live it's not in-person theater i'm using inverted commas because you are specifically talking about i recorded this with multi cameras in the space yeah so like um, allegiance or or bandstand sure for example. what sure. should we call that product I, 
You know, I actually, uh, to me, that actually does kind of fall into movie musicals. It's just a different soundstage, to be honest. Um, yeah, I, if you couldn't, t- my, my my excitement is what is it? What do we call it when it's digital but live in that venue, and it's not adding multiple cameras and editing, right? When we're actually mm-hmm. having that experience where things the go wrong. Stream. Yes. The live stream of the space. Sure, there can be multiple cameras, but like, what do we call that? That's what, I don't know. I'm, yes. I'm like, I am That's terrible at naming things. <laughs> <laughs> You'll need to pick that up if you're the president of marketing. Of the <laughs> <laughs> uh, where do you stand on bootlegs? Um, oh, well, I mean, I, I have watched so many of them. Uh, which is perfect for somebody who works in IP protection uh, to admit. <laughs> <laughs> I've watched so many and they have given me so much access. And what a shame that I didn't get to actually see, like, it's, you know, it was a means to an end at the time. It shows us there's an audience that are hungry to see things that they weren't able to see in the space for whatever reason. So, yeah, I think, I think bootlegs are a uh, sign that, that we need to figure out a better solution than Amen a legal copyright. What stage musicals do you wish had been filmed? Well, so many of them have been filmed, but you can only see them at the library, right? Which is amazing. Thank you, library, for keeping all of those. Yes, thank you, Betty Corwin and the Theater of Building Type. I mean, right, but that that access is, like, which ones do I wish were filmed that, like, I could, like, go home and watch on our ESPN theater channel. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I've got everything. I would, I would love to have a night woo, <laughs> where I watch <laughs> back to back all of the Broadway productions of Gypsy. I want to watch them back to back. I have definitely had the night where I watch all the roses turns back to back, but to be able to watch the entire production, like one after the other in maybe order, because I would be curious to see like, who was influenced by whose performance, Mm -hmm. but to be able to like go back and like do like Ethel and then Angela and right. And then tiny, like you're just watching them one by one and seeing like, I would be fascinated. That would be amazing. I want to do that for Hallow Dolly. It's my box set. We need You want to do it for Dolly. Yes. Box sets. Yeah. Carol Bailey. Yes. A million percent. Yes. Box sets with all the different, all the different casts. Yes. That is, that is my dream. Uh, What would you like to see filmed in the future? Can it be live instead of filmed? <laughs> I know you're. Yes, you, you you may you may uh, live stream or simulcast your production. <laughs> um, uh, I would like. I think it would be amazing to. Um, I, I'm always fascinated about one of the things I love about theater. Right, is um, as how each unique space. It brings their history, how, how this, not just like the physical space, but like the country we're in the time, right. That, that affects everything. So I think insert show of choice. Um, that is the less interesting to me. It's more interesting is how does one show look in multiple spaces around the world at the same time? Like, mm-hmm. and you know, um, I, I, I'm really fascinated and, and it obviously have to be a story that resonates with everybody. So let's pick what that show is. Obviously Wicked, right? Everybody loves Wicked. So, but, <laughs> but non-replica <laughs> productions, I want like, I want to see a non-replica production of Wicked from multiple places around the world. What does that look like? Yes. In a box set. Yeah. Well, but available on different, for a week, it's Wicked Week. And <laughs> for a week, yes. <laughs> each night we're streaming from a different country. Yes, but yes, it can be a box set. It can be a film. They can make <laughs> movies of it. That's fine. Yes. Finally, can we find you online? Uh, you can. Um, because I am the one and only Trey Lindoler. <laughs> that is where I am everywhere. Um, at Trey Lindoler on Twitter and Instagram. Always just Trey Lindoler. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, We will have links to that in the show notes. Traylon, thank you so much. This has been just so much fun and so inspiring. I am so excited for you to be president of Theatre Marketing Worldwide. (laughs) (laughs) Which is a volunteer position for sure. (laughs) (laughs) We'll find funding somehow. (laughs) When the people see the returns, they're going to throw money at you. Exactly, exactly. (laughs) 
Thank you so much again. Thank you. This, this is just a pleasure, really. And um, keep up the good fight. Keep spreading that word. Filmed Live Musicals podcast is created and edited by your host, Louisa Lyons. With thanks to our wonderful patrons, Josh Brandon, Belinda Broido, Elliot Charles, Gillian Dos Santos, Rachel Esteban, Mercedes Esteban Lyons, Rusty Fox, James T. Lane, Alison Matthews, Al Monaco, David McGrin, Amy Penn, Jesse Rabinowitz and Brenda Goodman, David and Catherine Rabinowitz, Joe Tillotson, and Beck Twist for financially supporting the site. FilmedLiveMusicals.com is the most comprehensive list of film stage musicals. You can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. If you would like early access to this very podcast, early access to site content, the full weekly newsletter with info on upcoming streams, and exclusive access to the streaming calendar, become a Film Live Musicals patron for as little as $3 US a month. And if you're outside the US, you can sign up in your local currency. Visit filmedlivemusicals.com to learn more. If you like what you hear, please leave a review through the Rate This Podcast link in the show notes. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and thanks for listening.